me to introduce uh, the, the cast and creators of the best comedy on television, uh, Veep. Some of them you know, some of them you, you might know their characters' names, but not their names, so let me just go through everybody here. We have with us Julia Louis-Dreyfus, who plays President Selena Meyer. David Mandel is the showrunner and executive producer. Oh, I skipped Tony Hale, I'm sorry. Tony Hale plays Gary Walsh. I apologize. I'm used to it. They did it on the, they did it, okay. Frank Rich is also an executive producer. You know Anna Klumsky as Amy Brookheim. Do you know the character Jonah Ryan? Are you familiar with <laughs> Timothy Simons is here. Timothy Simons is here. And then we're going to go, I guess that's counterclockwise. Clea Duvall plays Marjorie uh, uh, Palmani. <laughs> Clea Duvall. Sarah Sutherland plays Catherine Meyer. <laughs> Sam Richardson plays Lieutenant Governor Richard Splett. <laughs> Gary Cole is, is Kent Davidson. Kevin Dunn is Ben Cafferty. And Matt Walsh, you know, is Mike McClintock from McClintock. BuzzFeed print edition. <laughs> BuzzFeed print edition. So um, it's such an honor. Uh, they, when HBO asked me to do this, I, w I said yes in a second. and. Um, they sent me uh, links to all the screeners. I'm like, I've seen, I'm caught up. I know what happens. I'm just waiting for the last episode. Um, I will say the last time I was on a stage with a cast this big was um, the Simi Valley Republican primary de presidential <laughs> debate. There were 11, uh, and this is 12, but we had Donald Trump, and so I think I'm okay. I think I can do this. Let me start with the question that I think a lot of people want to know, which is, how's your health? How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I know that, that you worked uh, right through up until you, you couldn't work anymore, and then you came back. And tell, tell me about the experience of coming back after you had kicked its ass. Well, it was, um, I, I said this actually, I've said this to these guys many times, but coming, coming back to the show and uh, having that sort of light at the end of the tunnel, of this very dark tunnel through which I was walking, was a, a lifesaver for me. Um, it, uh, it was, you know, to be thinking about making jokes and working on script and performance and so on and so forth, it was a, just an absolute tonic. Uh, uh, particularly when I was in the, the throes of the most difficult times, so the the fact that I was that was came back, that everybody waited so patiently, that HBO waited so patiently and was so supportive, just meant the world to me. And and it's made it particularly difficult to say goodbye ultimately because um, it's that much. It, it feels that much sweeter, if that makes any sense. But, um, so I'm just one. I'm just a grateful girl. Well, I have to say, there's an extra, I feel like there's an extra energy in this last season, so if that's what that is, uh, part, partly at least. Well, partly. <laughs> um, and then the delay, uh, David, the, the delay uh, meant that there were some world events that happened <laughs> that, um, well, let me, let me put it this way. There was uh, a, a, a story in The Onion four years ago about hospice care for Gitmo prisoners. And the New York Times did that story like a week ago. Like in, in our first, I should, sorry, I'm sorry. Armando Iannucci created the show and I took over in season five. And in our first season, we did a president tweets story at which point you went running down the hall like with your hair on fire. The president is tweeting. And it was sh funny and shocking and unheard of. And that was a couple of years ago. That's, I mean, it, it just, it, and, it, and it has gotten progressively worse since then. And it's, incre <laughs> it's incredible to think, Tim, the uh, Jonah's anti-vax uh, <laughs> campaign platform, um, thankfully, the current president, who used to be an anti-vaxxer, 
uh, is no longer at least saying We don't publicly. necessarily know that he isn't anymore. Well, he, he said the right thing the other day, it. and I'm setting the bar very low these days. Yes. So <laughs> That's fine. He said, get your kids vaccinated for measles, so I was happy with that. So, but, I mean, but then he's going to be in a room with measles, and be like, measles made a really good point. You know? <laughs> like, whoever talks to him last, whoever talks to him last, will be like, I don't know, maybe we should, maybe should, a bunch of kids should die. <laughs> there literally was a headline in CNN yesterday about a kid who was suing so he didn't have to get the chicken pox vaccine catches the chicken pox. Literally, that was a plot line like a week ago. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I, I think all of us don't, we don't want we these things to come room. true. <laughs> like, <laughs> we sit in a room trying to think of what's the craziest, stupidest thing that could ever happen that we don't have to worry will never happen. Yeah. And they're coming true hourly. There was this one from today about like at the end of episode, the episode that you guys just watched, the thing about uh, Jonah saying like, you know, diseases come from immigrants and, and, and somebody just yells, kill them. And, and that happened like, last and, night in Tallahassee. And even yeah. Jonah Ryan has the good sense to be able to, not all of them. Like there are two or three good ones and he like lists them off. Like our current president, when that literally happened at his thing last night, he was like, that's a great joke. Like somehow the dumbest dude on television is smarter joking. than what's happening. I don't, I'm, I know it's not funny. It's not funny at all. I'm, it's I'm in funny. a crisis. I mean, like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I thought of it, uh, uh, Julia, when um, your character in, I don't know if it was episode four, but this season, when she's being attacked for her husband being so corrupt and she immediately starts ha attacking her opponent's husband for being corrupt. And I thought about to that today when President Trump started attacking Adam Schiff for being a con man. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, I can't even... Uh, was that a euphemism for uh, <laughs> Jewish? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I Frank, don't think so. Frank, you're at the 92nd Street Y. <laughs> Shh. Now you're telling me. I, I, just, I wonder, just really quickly, did I go to high school or Hebrew school with anyone in this audience? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I just wanted to know. Frank, how do, you stay in, how do you stay ahead of it, though? I mean, how do you stay ahead of it? I know you said, I read an uh, interview with you with The Hollywood Reporter, you said you don't want the show to feel dated, but what if, what if someday we're watching and people were thinking, oh, things were nice back then. That was... <laughs> so, yeah, it was so charming and quaint back then, exactly. The thing is, the, it's been like this from the beginning, even pre-Trump. I mean, we, we had a, a Selena email scandal that anticipated the Hillary Clinton thing by at least a couple of years. Um, but I think, you know, we don't, we never mention political parties. We don't mention any politician later than Reagan in, the, in a line of dialogue. And there was a moment when we started planning the last season and we decided it was going to be the last season, we actually, you know, the writers and Dave sat in the writer's room, broke the story, started writing scripts. Trump was already president. And we had a whole season that HBO signed off on, and then Julia got her diagnosis, and we had a what turned out to be a basically a year hiatus. As Julia was regathering her strength, it was clear it was getting ready to go back to work, but we still had a few months before we actually started shooting. I went out to visit her and to visit Dave, and I think David made just the greatest point about what had changed. It had it was just another year of Trump, but I. As, as you put it, we have this candidate or vice president, then president, who's despicable, who is terrible to her family, is corrupt, has no fixed ideology, believes in nothing except grabbing power, is completely rapacious, and yet Selena Meyer, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Selena, bravo, bravo. <laughs> yeah, uh, so Selena, Selena Meyer has been punished in the show for this. She loses elections, she gets humiliated. What do we do um, if you have someone who's actually president who's all of that and has been rewarded for it? And it led Dave well, just like what are the new levels of humiliation when you see so much of this stuff on it? Almost like a, you're just, you're seeing stuff that like our show, I mean, it's sort of what we were saying about the tweeting. If you think about it, like she would, she would accidentally say something in a speech and be, uh, hoisted on her, uh, her uh, own retard, yeah. which now, again, also seems quaint. And so all so whole, much, the pilot you know, hinged on that one joke. I know. So much right? of the show just seemed out of touch and out of fashion. And we did have to rethink things. But, a bit. but yeah. the way that I think that everyone rethought it 
job was not to try to slavishly imitate Trump or what's going on in Washington at all, but to really sort of philosophically uh, uh, look at the whole last season. And basically, we had a really great ending for the series uh, that we threw out. Uh, and as you'll see on this this coming Sunday, I think I think that you found a way to do it that's indirect and, and devastating and so still funny. You won't spoil Sunday's episode, but can you tell us the one you threw out? Or would that spoil Sunday? It, it, it equally spoil. Okay. It will, it, yeah, it, it, yeah it, would, it would have a, a seed a little bit of something that's in the... the I just want to chip in and say it was really fun to come back and see how you guys had cracked with that time, the administration, because you would see these jokes like, oh my God, that's so funny because we're so screwed. <laughs> like, but you know what I mean? We were finally able, because last the sixth season, she was building her library, so we we're sort of in a bubble, I think. We weren't as much in the milieu of DC in the campaign, so we were a little protective, but once we got back into it in season seven, it was really enjoyable to get at it. It was really fun to and see those jokes come in. I, I, just listening to you talk about this, Frank, don't you find that in the beginning of the series, we sort of were um, skewering and satirizing like the political arena and the people who work within it? And I think the, the events of our political system and the election and everything has made us have to now satirize society more and right so instead of humiliating the actual characters it's almost like we're 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 tasked with maybe examining the people who are voting for Jonah well look at the, your you know, story this season and you know look at Amy's story this season mm -hmm. the abortion episode mm -hmm. the, we're much more we're looking outward a little bit more than we were looking inward when we began I think right I, I agree it's why do we deserve these candidates like why I mean again it's sort of, I mean, I don't know how else to say it. It's like, it's the theory of is Trump an aberration or is he the beginning of a slew of Roman emperors? And if he is, and what we're seeing, I don't know, around the world with some of these other authoritarian regimes, what's going on? And so how do you tap into that and try and do it while we're in the middle of it and not seem like a Saturday Night Live sketch or a late night joke, but also try and at least give a little distance to it, even though yeah, it's all happening. I, I love the man up episode because it, it did just exactly that. Everything was totally, it was curtains for Selena and she comes up, you know, with her, you know, after she tells Catherine to man up and, and the people just love it. It's, that's it. That's all that you have to do is just come up with two. <laughs> Everybody in the audience runs like, oh, I hate women too. <laughs> and then they just, yes, <laughs> this is bravo. Or I bravo. don't know it, but I like those words yeah. and I don't know why. Yeah. So the, one of the greatest compliments I think I can give the show is that it is beloved by people in Washington, D.C. Who, who know how screwed everything is, and has been for a long time. This is pre-Trump. Um, like Mark Salter, who I think you know, McCain's former chief of staff, this is one of his favorite shows. I mean, it's just, it's so uh, brilliant. And um, I know that people come up to those of you who play staffers and say, oh, we have an Amy in my office, or things like that, right? Do you, do you, do you, I do had you a guy come up to me at the, it was a lunch before the correspondence dinner, and I, I don't think he was 40 years old, but he came up to me and he shook my hand, and he went, <laughs> I'm a Ben. <laughs> And I just, I just said, um, wow, a manic depressive alcoholic. And he went, <laughs> like that. What about you, Gary? Do you get that too? Do you get that too? I haven't run into a Kent, I don't think. He's so um, special. But I, I just, I, there, there's something about, especially from through the eyes of this character, the, the depravity, the, the hopelessness has only accelerated through the season. And I always think, you know, he couldn't be more distant than he was when he started. But he is, in fact, <laughs> not. You know, he's really retreated, it, at least in, in his own head. And he, he just, um, but it doesn't seem to, you know, affect his uh, uh, emotional health. I think Elon yeah. Musk is coming up with a yeah, yeah. yeah. Sarah, have you has have any offspring of presidents or senators reached out to you to talk to you about being the, the character you play? No, no offspring of presidents, but I've definitely had a fair share of interactions with women who've told me that their relationship with their mother is comparable to Catherine and Selena's. <laughs> that is so depressing. Yeah. <laughs> Devastating. Yeah, I remember putting my groceries down because one girl was particularly easily moved, and I just gave her a hug, and she cried on my shoulder. It was really, it was a really unexpected moment to come out of this show. <laughs> it was like very earnest and sweet. 
Clea, what about you? Any, uh, do you have any Secret Service agents or any, uh, <laughs> have anybody lots reached of, out to you from DC? Uh, lots of lesbian uh, <laughs> doppelgangers of presidential uh, of presidents. And, uh, like every day, and it's like, yes, I get it, me too. Uh, and S Sam, your character was just supposed to be in one episode, is that right? Yeah, it was supposed to be in uh, episode three, the first episode of se season three, it was just supposed to be one episode, uh, but I got some incriminating evidence on the rest of the cast and the creators, <laughs> so I parlayed that into two, uh, and then more photos and more stuff, and I made myself into the actual cast. Uh, but really, it was just supposed to be one episode, uh, but I think it just kind of, uh, it, it, it just went well. <laughs> yeah, that's an <laughs> so yeah. 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 I, think, I think you hit it out of the park. <laughs> I mean, I can't say that, but thank I you. I just said it for you. <laughs> someone, someone thank say you. it. You're amazing. You're amazing. <laughs> it was in Iowa. He had the Iowa book, book signing. You know, one, one story I like to tell about our show, which gives me a lot of pride, um, is that um, I had the great good fortune of meeting uh, Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan. A couple, yes, a couple years ago, and uh, actually a few years ago now. And um, at that time, um, uh, Justice Scalia was still with us, and uh, she. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and she told me that uh, she and uh, Tony would get together every week and uh, after Veep to have lunch and talk about the episode, <laughs> which is pretty cool, I think. You know. Am I correct in remembering too that your mother and Scalia shared a trainer yes. in DC and that and that the trainer was the go between to get you to autograph a picture? Which, which I actually refused to do. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah, stick it to the man. <laughs> I we saw how that ended. Um, so <laughs> I, I don't, I, I, this is very important, so I do want to do this at some point, and I, I want to do it now before I forget, which is, I really would like to know what everybody's favorite insult is. Um, uh, and I, I assume everybody here is okay with curses, <laughs> or you wouldn't be here. Um, you, don't like, you don't like this question? Or? I love it, I'm just thinking. You're thinking. Does it have to be one that we said, or just any? From, from the show, I think. No, yeah. no, no, I mean... <laughs> oh, no, anybody characters. could have said it. You, your, char your, not, your character doesn't have to have said it. I think mine okay. is, I mean, most of them go towards sweet Timothy Simons, yeah. which is very sad for Jonah, but mine favorite was um, Frankenstein's monster if the monster was made entirely of dead dicks. <laughs> <laughs> that is just so good. And actually, I think Zach Woods came up with that one. I think another I one was, uh, for me, was, uh, it's a mistake, like when Bigfoot raped your mother. <laughs> Are these all gonna be joking? And you were born. My, my favorite, I mean, one of my very favorites always was, um, that's like uh, trying to use a croissant as a dildo. Um, it, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't do work. It doesn't and it, it makes a fucking mess. It makes a fucking mess. <laughs> David and Frank, do you want to weigh in? I mean, they must be like choosing among your children, but. Uh. <laughs> These are mainly your children. No, no. Um, I did enjoy, uh, I'm s sorry, Tim. The no, it's, <laughs> it's okay. I mean, by this point, I, if I, I was uh, still upset about it. <laughs> you know, but uh, the, the melted putty on the flag. Melted Play-Doh yeah. stuck to a flagpole. But I, I also did really, recently, I did enjoy when Furlong, Furlong, his entire run when he came into the Florida office and said, Bruckheimer, after you get an abortion, you're not supposed to dress it up and run it for president. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and then, and then, that is, asked a, that your is wife some dark business. What, what rape dungeon she crawled out of, and then told you to have a nice, uh, Oh, we be oh, slide, we be slide down, down the, the shower, shower wall. wall. Oh. I will was say a, that was a bam, bam, bam. Yeah. I think a test to to the character's resilience is in that uh, that testimony episode, like when they're doing like the Joan ad files, and and like I, there was a part of me that thought like at the end of season four, the writers just had a whole bunch that they hadn't used, and they were like, well, shit, we got to get these out. <laughs> so like in in the testimony episode, they're running through all of them, and he really thinks that if he's like, my college friends called me Tall McCartney, he thinks that's the one that might stick. Like he has the, he has the thing like, oh no, I know, how to, I know how to beat this. I know how to get around this. It's Tall McCartney. 
so I've always been a big fan of that one. He's full of hope. He has hope. I want everybody to weigh in on this. I, I, I just remember one that didn't make the show was I, I called you Herman Kunster. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that an alt to Hunter S. Thompson? Because I was, I was like, <laughs> yeah, because I, oh my yeah. God. <laughs> Gary, you have. I, I stick with the Hall of Fame one, which is. Uh, 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 now I forgot. Jolly, <laughs> Jolly, yeah, Jolly Green Jizz Face, <laughs> followed by Long Tall Sally, both men for Tim. Yeah. Sam, you have, you got one? I mean, I think like the wrong shape. <laughs> it's all just shows. right to the point. Just like. <laughs> <laughs> they, call, they say Jonah's just the wrong shape. <laughs> Sarah? Um, we were talking about this earlier, the, where someone says, where did AIDS come from? And Mike says, I think some guy fucked a monkey. <laughs> that one gets me. There was more context, but yes, that was yeah. the joke. <laughs> there was the joke. The context is a kid has AIDS or something like that. Yes. And there's Selena yeah. says, where did AIDS come from? Well, Mike, where's all this AIDS come from? Where did all this AIDS come from? <laughs> I don't know, some guy fucked a monkey? <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for the curtain to close. Um, yeah. Clea. Uh, I think I just like the very simple, Catherine, why is that your hair? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ju Julia, you haven't weighed in, I don't know. I know, because I just love all of these things so much, it's very hard to pick one. But uh, this season, uh, Clea, when you brought uh, breakfast to Selena in bed, and I, and I just said, you can't just replace Gary with another lesbian. <laughs> I think I'm not going to notice. Yeah. <laughs> there is... <laughs> Every once in a while, there are those, and I'm not. It's not really an insult directed at anybody, but one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite ones from the whole run was in this season as well. Speaking of lesbians, is like when you're like, "Can somebody get me a real green juice? I'm drinking Adwala, like some country lesbian who just moved to the big city," and I'm not sure who that's insulting. <laughs> Again, we're going after society. Tim, that was actually Tim. That was actually about you. Sorry. Oh, oh God. It was a Jonah reference. Uh, many, Paul, Paul many? McCartney. How many writers are there on the show? How many people in the writer's room? Um, we have uh, one writer who kind of commutes a little bit still between London, so she's not always with us. And we have one writer who is with us during the summer and then goes back to SNL. But most of the time is like, I think like sort of 12 or 13. And one of the real luxuries, and I'm always happy to say this, is on most shows, the writers go away very quickly. And HBO has always been really incredible about basically letting us hold on to the writer's staff. So basically, as we're doing a scene, as the actors are working on a scene, I, I just have a, I have a staff of people, just any, any just moment of silence, anything that's not working, just, we're just constantly throwing new jokes into the scene and at these people, and they're rolling with it and adding them, and it's part of why everything gets to be so jam-packed in a really great way. And I might add, just to, it's such a great part of the process, even before we get to that point of people throwing stuff in at the last minute on set, there are alts. Explain the process of alts, because it's... It's, just, it's basically like on any scene that we're shooting in a given day, basically, especially like the night before, Julia, Julia will go through and I'll go through and kind of identify any areas, things that maybe aren't hitting yet, or even just things like, we like this, but maybe something else, or maybe we've, you know, and believe it or not, we do sometimes say to ourselves like, Boy, we've had a lot of dick jokes this week. Maybe, maybe this dick joke could be something else. Or we yeah. de-fuck a script. Right. We will go through fuck, yeah. and just try and take out, especially if we're just saying fuck for no good reason. If it's an exquisite fuck, we yes. want it. But if someone's just like sometimes just throwing a fuck into a scene, we'll pull that out. We'll either try and do it in there or we'll do it in the editing too. Yeah. But uh, but the, so the writers will basically just sort of as, as we get to every scene, I'm sort of almost like hit with like almost like a phone book of choices and I get to kind of go through and uh, so it's just, it's just a process of constantly trying to every stage of the show I guess I will say is we're all constantly just trying to make it better it, no matter one of our right till the end one of our writers was promoted off of alts right do, yeah, I, do I know that story our, uh, yeah. she started as a writer's assistant her name's uh, Amelia, Amelia Barro Barossi is that how you pronounce it Barras Barras sorry yes that's um, all right and she was a uh, she was answering the phones and at some point or another, because all the submissions are sort of blind, not for any particular reason, but I don't care. It's just 
a joke's a joke. And at some point or another, it was sort of like, that was like Amelia's 10th joke in. And so when we came back this season, we made her a staff writer. I mean, as, as, well, as well you would. But I mean, she was killing it. And it's just jokes are jokes. I don't, you know, we'll take them in from anywhere. She's now in line to succeed Les Moonves at CBS. <laughs> And how much uh, does improv play a role at all? I don't know how many of the actors even come from uh, improv tradition. Well, in the beginning of the, oh, something's happening. Oh. I think they're, they're selling just, tickets. They're cigarettes. Cigars, they're cigarettes. cigarettes. Cigars, cigarettes. Cigars. 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 They're the, getting questions from the audience. Okay. You know? um, uh, I didn't mean to embarrass you. Um, the, the, the show uh, began, um, uh, with Armando Iannucci, and part of his process, his writing process, was to write, but also sort of con concurrently write while rehearsing. So there was um, improvisational skills were very much a part of the of the DNA of the show, and um, and then as the show has sort of morphed over the years, it has uh, become certainly m more, I would say, written on the day. Having said that, though, everybody here is very skilled at improv or feeling if something needs a little, what I like to call sort of zhuzhing, which is kind of messing things up so they seem a little more dense or real or I don't know what. And so. Um, Can you give me an example of zhuzhing? Oh, just shit, I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> well, it's I just. Go ahead, please no. Well, simply put, if there's an elevator scene. Sorry. And uh, That's fine. And Julie would say, oh, we need to zhuzh this up. My interpretation is like, let's mess it up, let's overlap the lines, That's right. and let's not worry about hearing every word of everybody's. Because sometimes when you're doing a scene, it feels like, I say my line now, she says her line, you know what I mean? So right. part of zhuzhing to me is that that's my first take on that. Right, a lot of overlap in the way one does in real life. Um, and mm -hmm. it, it, of course, it doesn't happen all the time, but it hap it, it's definitely a part of the, the tone of the show. Um, and uh, so anyway, it's been, it's, the show has sort of morphed over the years, and I, I, and I don't think one way is better than the other, but everybody was, has been very flexible, and, and it's, it's worked pretty well. Yeah, no, it's Absolutely. great. Th th there was this great moment of physical comedy with you and Tim. I guess it's uh, Splett has decided he's going to go be the mayor, so he can't work for either one of you. He's working for both of you at the same time, and you both keep looking at each other, but it's timed perfectly that you're never looking at each other at the exact same time. How many takes did that, <laughs> did that take? I mean, that must have been difficult. 27. <laughs> no. no. It, was just, it was great, though. I mean, that's... Yeah. We, that's the other thing too is these guys are always looking for places to add physical stuff like that's always a little hard to like write in per se and I, I am the first to say um, you guys would be surprised to see the scripts like when it comes to Tony here and Gary they're often sometimes we as writers because we're just lazy sons of bitches will add in just Gary doesn't like that or uh, or Gary makes, makes a, a sound. noise yeah. yeah Gary makes a sound and then just sit back and go, okay, Tone. <laughs> and he delivers, and you watch it, and you laugh at it, because it's just incredible. Yeah. What's it, what's it like to get that script when it, when it says Gary? Well, when Gary makes a sound, <laughs> if, if, what I noticed, and especially this past, well, it's evolved. <laughs> Tony's verbal um, kind of commentary, and I don't mean words. I just mean sounds Noises. emanating from Noises. his body. <laughs> uh, if you're in close proximity to it, um, it 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 gets a bit overwhelming, and I, I, <laughs> well, and the best. I, sorry, no, no, no. I know, I, what I've noticed is that sometimes it's not even picked up by the camera. If you're standing really close to me, at any time anybody else is speaking, you will just hear. Yeah, and a lot of the fun of that is because Selena, <laughs> Selena. Yeah, there's a whole vocabulary of moaning that I can do, but Selena doesn't let Gary speak. So he's not allowed to speak, so it's his form of expression. <laughs> he, he communicates that way. And the, but to your kind of physicality thing, the, the joy of this whole process is Dave and these writers give us such beautiful frameworks and these lines and the, just the playground to play in. And then but when we get on set, it's so fun to be like, okay, how can we bump this up and make this crazier? So like she'll be like, okay, I'm gonna drop my coat and then you dive in and grab it here. Or I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna get my arm caught here. I'm gonna get, do something with a purse just to try to find that physicality. And that time when I caught you over the banister and like pulled you up, it's like, that is like, ah. Uh, and the, that kind of chaotic choreography, I'm gonna really, really miss that. Really yeah. miss that. And also,
also when we're very close to one another, and like the when I yeah. fed you in your bed. Yeah. <laughs> Which was the pasta, the pasta sandwich. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That yes. That was yes. pretty. Because the best part about <laughs> that was. I was sick in the episode, and so she thought, well, I'm going to be great, and I'm going to deliver some food to him in bed. And she grabbed a cold chicken sandwich out of the refrigerator, cut it up, and put it on stale pasta. Yes. And continued telling me about the chef cooking you salmon. Salmon and asparagus. <laughs> asparagus, and how delicious it was. Yes. And I said, I, that sounds great. <laughs> I think your exit from the presidential library display over the wall? I, oh, over the wall. Yeah, was the, the little the, divider. Most brilliant oh, pieces oh, of Hardcore the over the wall, yeah. Uh, that was Descri Lucy, descri yeah. Describe that a little to catch oh, people up. That was yeah. I Love Lucy on her mm -hmm. best day, honest yeah. to God. I, I think one of the things that's sort of coming up, one of the things I really about the process that I really like is that now that the show is sort of larger and we're kind of all off on our own storylines, I will see, and I think we will all hear scenes for the first time at the table read, but by the time they air, I get to watch the scenes that I was not a part of as a fan because they have changed so much they are not recognizable from what was in the table read. So like that, when I saw Tony saving Julia from going over the railing, that was the first I had ever heard of it. So it was just, it's a really lovely, I, I guess I'm saying this just in case anybody thinks it's weird that we're all like, oh, I also love that moment. Like, I am a very big <laughs> fan of the work of the people on this show because I get to watch it just as somebody who is not even on that show. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Anna, I read in The Hollywood Reporter, they described uh, Amy's look this season as Kellyanne Conway-esque. Was, it was, she definitely has a new look. What was yeah. Kelly, did, did the counselor to President Trump, Kellyanne Conway, did she inform the look? She, um, so it's, it's certainly not a parody, um, but, but the, I'll say that like, she certainly, and, um, and other um, aggressive, mm, uh, morally questionable Machiavellian, uh, um, female political thinkers who have whose popularity has kind of risen with this current populism um, have have served as major guideposts for Amy's path does that make sense to you sure. so yeah it's um, I, I feel like I was very fascinated by by just how um, I don't know wrapped this whole country is especially in the media by um, this sort of personality and the stuff they'll spew and it occurred to me that like Amy's never really gotten to realize her f truest potential <laughs> um, and now that we've seen what this populism can do um, it just felt so right to take Amy in that direction and I feel like she's just blossomed into a monster <laughs> Julia, do you think that this season is more nihilistic or tougher or, or the jokes are edgier? Do you think it's different than previous seasons? Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's extreme. It's much more extreme than it was even the season prior. Um, and, uh, you know, but extreme times call for this kind of extreme comedy. And, um, uh, you know, we're sort of, re it, it, it's, it's, this is the culture we're living in, and like we say, we're not doing a parody. You can't tell what party we're in, but um, we have had to push the edge of the envelope and then some. I will say that the vast majority of the material we've done this season would never have flown in season four or three or even five. But, uh, not to whatever, but to go the other way for a second, if we were doing, if this season that was currently airing, if like we were just doing a version of, I'll just simply say, season five, and pick any season, I don't think you guys would be watching. You would go like, that just seems out of touch and dated and like weird. Because all, so many of the, what the DNA of the show had so, so much of it, like all the things that were shocking were, are no longer, I mean, it sort of goes back to the tweeting thing. It's just like, again, the foundations of the show were let's peek behind closed doors and see what these politicians are really like. There are no closed doors. This notion of secretly uh, politicians talk dirty, uh, again, you know, it's just like that's not a secret anymore. I mean, so, so it works sort of in a very sort of both ways, unfortunately. Aren't we're we right 
rightfully so. Art yeah. reflects life. Satire reflects life, right. and that's what that's what we've done, especially right. with the tone. The plot line of the Chinese uh, putting twenty five million dollars into the right that, <laughs> like four seasons ago, two se three seasons ago, people would have been like, "That's silly." It's just, it's <laughs> where's that coming from? That's just, that, that would never happen. And what does satire mean again? <laughs> I'm sorry. Nobody knows. Okay. All right. Also, um, what we've done with school shootings uh, this mm. and, and mass shootings this season, we couldn't have done that a couple of seasons ago. Well, let me ask you about that because because I, I um, that's obviously thank you. Whoop. There are no carts, people. Run them out. Run them out. That was a really smooth transition. Yeah. That went really well. Uh, the, the, I, want, I do want to ask you about that because that was that was something of a risk to 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 make a comedy moment about just like how many horrific shootings there are in this in this in this country was that did that did you think twice about it was it something you discussed or was it just like this is america we're making fun of it and people need to deal well, with it i wouldn't say that that came easy necessarily i mean i, I you would you agree with me that i mean we the, the writers for sure and all of us and dave thought long and hard about how to to exactly stick that landing of a theme of a joke, uh, but it's hardly a, a joke, needless to say. But but there were a lot of iterations of those jokes within the script, and it went through many passes. And some things we pulled out, and some yeah. things we tweaked up more. And we took it, it, right? Though, I mean, we took it incredibly seriously. Because yes, it's horrible. And I will also point out that it was a script where there was an incarnation in 2017 pre-cancer that had, I think, a shoot, like maybe one shooting joke in it, like, like in, a, in passing. Right. And it was when we came back a year later, only like basically 365 days later, and there had been as many shootings and as there had been, and, as, and they had gotten just so much more horrible than so many schools and Las Vegas and all of these things where it, it just, I mean, again, it was, it was dangerous, but you know, we took it seriously and felt yeah. the horror is the matter of factness. And that's, and in a way, if we can, we're not asking anyone to laugh at school shootings. We're asking why are politicians not paying attention? Of course. And yeah, no, no, I, I mean, I'm just saying, and so we, we took it incredibly seriously, but just felt like, I don't know, for me, it, it felt like, if not us, who? I, I'm, I, that's my honest opinion. And As I, Rabbi Hillel once said, I believe. <laughs> and I, and I, that's I, upstairs. <laughs> I, I'd make one other point, too, which is it's, we did it while being consistent to the characters in the show. One of my favorite moments in, at the very top of the first season is when Selena thinks the president has had a heart attack and may be dying, and she's so excited <laughs> that it might allow her to run the situation room, and of course it ends with, you don't even get a souvenir pen from it. <laughs> but it's consistent with Selena this season thinking, how can I use this tragedy of a, of a school shooting to, em you know, to, to enhance my power to solve a political issue? So it's a straight line there, even if the, the details have changed with the news. Julia, let me just ask you, because you've played Elaine Bennis, who's beloved, you've played Christine, who's beloved. Um, was it liberating or weird to play a character who's just such a horrible person? Oh, completely liberating. <laughs> I, I mean that, I didn't mean it to be funny. I mean, really, uh, to play someone who has no, uh, uh, there are no restraints, uh, even though she's frustrated, but she has an ego that's utterly out of control. I mean, I call her, she's a toddler in, in middle-aged garb, and, um, and, uh, so yeah, she has no no sense of responsibility or uh, uh, towards anyone around her or humanity. Uh, she is not a good citizen, and uh, she only thinks of herself. So the idea of tapping into that kind of extraordinary ego, undeveloped ego, was just heaven on earth. All right, let me get to some of the questions from the uh, nice people in the audience. Would Selena defeat Trump in 2020? Uh, well. Trump is not in Selena's world, so pass on that question. Will Mike begin a new journey as an MSNBC contributor to Morning Joe? Uh, Mike would love that gig. He would love to be a, a news person and have a regular gig on 
television. Jonathan writes, Julia, what exactly is a jolly green jizz face? That guy right there. <laughs> Tom McCartney. <laughs> We're doing good. As a, as a BuzzFeeder, my team is so impressed at how accurately you recreated our office and people. <laughs> how did you do it and why BuzzFeed? Well, I would ask the writers why oh, BuzzFeed. No, I want to hear why you think. <laughs> Well, I think Gloucester it's the most ridiculous first. place for Mike to land and also to hang out with 25-year-olds in a beat-up house and crank out lists for a living. <laughs> I think it's a solid that comic is premise. That is the correct answer, exactly. Okay. And I like, uh, also like the busyness. That when we have his show going on, there's all this stuff going on, the graphics. It's very hard to follow. <laughs> this one, I guess, could go to anybody. What was your proudest moment on set? Can I, ask, can I answer that one very sincerely? Yes. We were talking about this, Clea and I were talking about this sort of toward the end of the, of the run of the show. I think this is something that I'm incredibly proud of, that from the beginning, this meant a lot to me, that I, w like, I was brand new when I started on this show. I was welcomed in wholeheartedly by people that had a lot more experience than me and made to feel like a valued member of the, the team of the show. And I think the ensemble that we built not only extended to the performers and to the writers and directors, but we, I think we made a lot of efforts to extend that also to people that maybe were gonna come in for one episode and then became a large part of the show, and then to, our, to people that, were, uh, that uh, were, were gonna be on for one episode or were gonna recur. I feel like we, we tried to make a warm and welcome environment for, uh, for people coming on to the show, because it's a hard show. It was a chaotic show. It's hard to film. Like though, as much as we sort of romanticize the the rehearsals with Ormando, there were da there were days where you'd go uh, leave the room and be like, I don't know if I did a single thing right today, and and that is something that I think I'm really proud of that we all built together. That's a very sincere answer to that very question, nice. but that is something. Does anybody else want to weigh in on? I just remember, I guess it was kind of humiliating at first, but I was eventually proud. Was, um, after season two. Um, it was the last day, and, and uh, I was at lunch. I uh, came in late, and Armando was at lunch, and um, I, um, I I said I, I asked him if I could be on the show <laughs> as a regular. <laughs> <laughs> and I just was like, as soon as I said it, I was like, oh, you stupid asshole. <laughs> and um, he just sat that showing, and he said, I, I think that would be quite good. And I called my manager. I was gonna, supposed to sign for a pilot, and I, I had it sewed up that night. So I was that was very. I was proud that I stuck my said something. Stuck my neck I'm out. I'm glad you did. And we're all glad you did. I would have said no, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't gotten along the whole time. Um, a woman <laughs> named Netta asks: Selena wears a red dress at the beginning of the first episode of each season. Is there any reason for this artistic decision? Um, it was an instinct. Uh, I, it was important to me. I think red is an, um, a powerful color, and I, it felt like a powerful way to begin each season, to be frank. Um, and Selena wears red a lot, but it was very important for me to start the season with that sort of, you know, packing a punch of red. That's interesting. With so much snappy dialogue and sarcasm between so many characters during the entire episode, does each character have their own personal scriptwriter? And how much, if any, dialogue is spontaneous? Uh, no, everybody, everybody, what? <laughs> what? Now was the time I said, I have had my own personal <laughs> script. <right? laughs> so, where? <laughs> just wanted to come out and say it. <laughs> Tony, I've had a ghostwriter this entire writer. time. <laughs> I was just going to throw in, there are. Within our writing group, there are definitely some people sometimes where if a certain character scene comes up, we're like, why don't you go do it? And then there are certain characters, I will say like when Furlong shows up, you, the, the pile of like sort of horrific alts for him to say gets very big, as do the Jonah insults. But I, I was just gonna say, it's, it's, a, it's a credit to all of you guys that for a show that I think could sometimes maybe be dismissed as, oh, everyone's just cursing. Like, yeah. there are 12, 13, you add a couple more of our, like, sort of semi-recurring people, there are often, like, 15 very 
different distinct voices and characters. And I can only say from a writing standpoint that some of them are obvious that like say a Kent line is a Kent line and a Ben line is a Ben line, but everybody's line is everybody's line. And it's, it's one of the most wonderful things about the show and it existed before I got there and it was very fun to play in that world. Everybody is just so distinct that sometimes it's like thinking, what would this character do, say or do in this situation? I mean, it, it kind of connects back to Gary makes a noise because it's sort of like he would. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. You know. I wish we could show all the takes of uh, the Embassy Suites uh, noise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was so sweet. Embassy Suites. But I would say also we had this, Jake may interest you particularly, we have one writer, I think we can name Billy Kimball, who has worked a bit in politics, worked with Al Franken, and has a particular genius for writing speeches for Selena that go say on forever, nothing. that say nothing in as many different <laughs> ways. They sound really great. They sound they really sound great. Really it's good. every cliche, and it's, it's like tissue paper. And he also worked a lot on, if we can say that maybe perhaps Julia didn't write Selena's memoir that was published <laughs> uh, a couple of, a few weeks ago. And Billy wrote a lot of that, and I, I encourage people to uh, dig into it because it is hilarious bullshit that just goes on for hundreds of pages about <laughs> America and the American dream and and from Mike's point of view and were yes. written in Selena's voice. Yes. Right. And so then if you get the audiobook, yes, you will find that big portions of this book are redacted within the audiobook. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not gonna say that? Yeah. Yeah, of course, because it's like it's clearly written by you, and so she's like, I'm not gonna fucking say this. And so it's all in the art. So there are lots of uh, lots of layers, lots of layers. Um, we're running out of time, uh, but I just want to say, on a personal note, uh, this show uh, has helped me a lot just to get through uh, the craziness of covering all this. And I think I speak for everybody so nice. when I say thank you so much. Julia, I know this is the last time uh, that everybody's going to be together on a public event. You're going to get together, I guess, for to, to watch the last episode uh, together. But um, is there anything you want to say? I just obviously you're the woman. Uh, do you do you? Is there anything you want to say? I'm a woman. The, yeah. the woman. The woman. Oh, I thought the, you said a woman. The. <laughs> as a woman. Woman of color. <laughs> Never start a sentence with as a woman. Actually, I would, because I was thinking about your question about uh, proudest uh, moment, and I have many moments of pride about this show, but I will say the one thing that did come to my mind um, is that as we were wind, uh oh, uh -oh I'm going to try not to cry, but as we were winding up the final season, a uh, fin final episode of the show, and each character on the show um, had their final scene, obviously. And um, it would gave me great pride that we all gathered for everybody's last scene. And um, it was a big showing. Um, we actually really, as cynical and heinous and horrible as these people are <laughs> that we play, we have a lot of love in our hearts for one another as people. And um, that gave me a, a great amount of joy that there was this feeling of support to the bitter end. And, um, and I'll carry it with me for the rest of my life. Well, that's a beautiful way to go out. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the creators and the cast of Veep.